working on this series. Uh, before I introduce Mr. Uh, Hal Foster, I'd like to remind you that the next official event of this lecture series will take place on Tuesday, not Monday, October 13th. And just to make it even more confusing, it will be not in this space, but at UCLA. Uh, that is because the next lecturer, who is Hans Hollein, is being co-sponsored by UCLA and SciArc. And so the lecture will take place Tuesday at 8 p.m., the 13th of October, in Moore Hall at UCLA. And good luck parking. Uh, however, I've been allowed to tell you, but you are not supposed to spread this around, uh, that on mo next Monday, a week from today, there will be an informal chat with Hans Hollein right here in this space uh, between 4 and 6 p.m. So those of you that have some legitimate reason for being here and for chatting with Hans Hollein are invited to come talk to him on Monday, October 12th at 4 o'clock uh, at this very same place. This evening, uh, our lecturer will be Hal Foster, who until recently was senior editor, I believe, at uh, Art in America, and who has uh, edited uh, two books, uh, Decodings, Recodings, excuse me, and The Anti-Aesthetic, and is about to come out with a third volume called Discussions in Contemporary Culture, uh, number one, which will be published by the Dia Art Foundation, uh, for which we have a, uh, a flyer here, which you can all have. It will have many of the usual suspects, uh, uh, Douglas Crimp and Michael Fried, Rosalind Krauss, Dan Graham, uh, Michael Fayer, and so forth. Um, uh, Mr. Foster is also involved with uh, Zone Books. Many of you have undoubtedly seen Zone Issues 1 slash 2, and uh, Zones Issues 3 and 4 will be coming out next year. In the meantime, Zone Books will be publishing a whole series of books collected here in this wonderful catalog. Um, Mr. Foster has engaged in all of these activities to, if I may paraphrase some of his writings, uh, make it apparent to us that there is a distinction between modernity and modernism, and that in, uh, instead of accepting rather nostalgically the preconceptions that the only way to deal with the processes of modernization which define our society is to resort to modernistic styles, we must instead question uh, the given forms of representations and methods of communication uh, through which we make our objects and make our, uh, our architecture, in the case of us architects. Uh, and I hope that uh, Mr. Foster will help us uh, question in a critical manner the manner in which we make uh, our architecture and the context in which we place our architecture. Hal Foster. Okay, I, I feel that I should begin with an apology or two. First of all, my title is extremely pretentious. Uh, it's called Neo-Futurism architecture and technology. And second of all, uh, I'm not really an architecture critic, so my talk tonight will be short um, for this reason, because I really practice here without a license. And also it will be short because it's a topic that is wide open, and rather than talk it at you, I'd rather discuss it with you. Anyway, uh, I want to begin with a, a real prime piece of ideology an ad placed by AT&T in various American journals and magazines over the last year or so. It is called, quote, Issues of the Information Age, Promises Kept, Promises to Keep. Now, it comes with a, uh, a photograph, an image. And on one side is a silhouette of an old man and a little girl. I think we are to take them as grandfather and granddaughter in conversation by the doorway of a pre or postmodern house. On the other side is this text. And I want to read it because I think it's, it's really an extraordinary document. I mean, there's so many extraordinary documents in the New York Times and the LA Times that you know, it's hard not to be blasé about them. But this one really struck me. It reads, at the beginning of this century, theater and veil 
president of AT&T, understood his competition, not just as other telephone companies, but as distance, loneliness, separation. He foresaw that the success of his company could end the geographic isolation of man. And in ending that isolation, the company's success would be assured. The vision became reality. By the mid-70s, America had universal telephone service. Today, as the information age has begun, there is a new kind of isolation. People are awash in a mounting sea of information, yet unable to connect or work with information in an orderly, useful form, that is, with the world's knowledge. Often, information machines do little to help. They are difficult to use, rigid in their demands, generally unable to work with any but their own kind. To overcome this new kind of isolation, we have a new vision to make the, the information age universal, to help build a worldwide telecommunity, not just open to all, but inviting. At AT&T, we are now working toward the day when people around the world will be able to handle information in any form, conversation, data, images, text, as easily as they make a phone call today. And they will be able to get information in a form they can use whenever they need it from wherever it is. We envision a vast global network of networks, the merging of communications and computers, linking devices so incredibly capable they will bend to the will of human beings rather than force humans to bend to theirs. Obviously, no one company, no one nation, can universalize the information age. It will take the best minds of many companies and many nations. The needs of our consumers are creating imperatives for our industry. We need common standards and, comp and compatibility. We need national and international policies that are open and encouraging. And we need to make information machines far easier to use. We have the science to construct the systems now. The technology is rapidly taking shape. We are dedicating our minds, our energy, our resources, our future to making telecommunity a reality, to bringing the best of the information age to the world. Our vision has its roots in AT&T's heritage of service. Just as the telephone extended the reach of the human voice, Telecommunity will extend the reach and capability of minds and talents. Telecommunity is our goal. Technology is our means. We are committed to leading the way. Promises, promises. Uh, now my purpose here is not to critique the ad. That hardly seems necessary. It's corporate humanism that what is good for AT&T is good for man. It's patently ideological. And few people are so naive as to believe it entirely. What interests me, though, is how AT&T here rewrites certain sophisticated theories for its own purposes. How it recodes not only the dialectical idea of technology as both cause and cure of isolation, but also the theoretical discourse of the postmodern. Recodes them precisely so as to fit its own global agenda. First, the ad distinguishes between two historical forms of isolation, a pre-modern geographic isolation that produced by technology is also remedied by technology in the AT&T story by the good old telephone, and a postmodern informational isolation that again, produced by technology, a babble of information machines, will also, according to the AT&T story, be remedied by technology. The description of the second uh, isolation of a society, quote, awash in a sea of information, of a culture, quote, unable to connect, is very reminiscent of theories of postmodernism, of a culture of pastiche or collage as presented by Frederick Jameson, or a society of ruined narratives or, or broken ideological systems as presented by Jean-Francois Lyotard. In fact, AT&T here uses these diagnoses of fragmentation as a foil to set up its own program of a new totality, new connection of all things, what the ad calls telecommunity, quote, a vast global network of networks. Now granted, this is a corporate fantasy, not yet a lived reality. But who's to say that such a network is not in the works? No one company, 
no one nation, the ad says, can achieve this telecommunity. Here, AT&T is blatant in its call for a corporate global politics, a consortium that goes beyond the confines of mere nation states, a logic that treats all knowledge as so much instrumental information, a research and development program that accesses techno science as it sees fit. By the way, in this world of AT&T, the two, science and technology, are no longer distinct. A whole, in sum, a whole system, a system that determines, quote, international policies to suit its own ends. Now, I don't mean to be, you know, Orwellian about all this, but the ad is, I think, a really impressive document and one that needs to be taken seriously. The question is here, I guess, for us, is how to take it seriously in relationship to architecture. How does this problematic of a future telecommunity relate to the problem of a contemporary architecture? How else but in its very contradictions or conflicts? For telecommunity is almost a, a contradiction in terms. You know, telecommunications and community, they don't necessarily go together. After all, telecommunications, or rather the capital that drives such technology, erodes rather than builds uh, community or traditional community, makes obsolete not only uh, public space, but the very common experience of space as such. In fact, this very contradiction that somehow you know, advanced technology can, can make for a new community, uh, I think is expressed in the, in the now famous AT&T building by Philip Johnson. A global telecommunications corporation wrapped in the nostalgic image of a national vernacular, the Chippendale uh, motif, and set in the anachronistic mode of a neoclassical public sphere the, the facade and the atrium, when it is precisely such multinational telecommunicational corporations as AT&T that have rendered such vernaculars, such publics, archaic, if not entirely absent now. Now, I know this building is an egregious example, and, and by the time it gets to me, it's, it's such a dead horse to flog that there's you know, no real charm in it anymore. But is there any architecture that might not be ideological in this way? What architecture might counter, let alone deconstruct, the whole idea, the whole ideology of a telecommunity? Or for that matter, this idea of an information age or a post-industrial society or even a, a postmodern period? I mean, what, what architecture can really deal with these, uh, these, these ideological concepts, if not yet live realities? Now here, the old problem of a counter-architecture rises again. How, in the words of Alda van Eyck, can one pose a counter-form to a society that doesn't really seem to have a form? If this is indeed our condition as, as postmodern critics, writers, architects, filmmakers, blah, 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 they all seem to, to suggest in one way or another that fragmentation is our, our condition, formlessness. If this is our condition, the model of a collage city presented by Colin Rowe sounds less like the basis of an architecture of resistance and more like an apology for things as they are, for the chaos of modern development. This architecture, this collage architecture, Rem Koolhaas wrote recently about Manhattan, relates to the forces of the Grosstadt or the city as a surfer does to a wave. In other words, you know, the concept of a collage city is in no way resistant, it seems to me, to these developments. It's, it's really just a, a cover for them in many ways. Now, I don't mean this criticism to suggest that the other extreme, the urban utopias posed by, you know, various modernisms, is now somehow valid again. Far from it. As Robert Venturi showed a long time ago, such modernist monuments do not transform the city into a, a new experience or new lived totality. As isolated fragments, they simply tear it up all the more. But this, in turn, does not leave us alone with the architecture of Venturi. At least, I, I hope it doesn't. Though clearly a more provocative thinker than, than Philip Johnson or, to my mind, even Colin Rowe, he too practices scenography more than architecture, pop more than critique. And even his populism does not run very deep. I mean, after all, 
he remains a, a court architect. I could go on with this list of, I'm sure to you, very naive and very innocent uh, ideas of architecture that, at least for me, uh, architects that are corollary examples uh, to this, this late capitalist situation. For example, I don't know why, but I think Peter Eisman and Aldo Rossi, for me, are another set of corollary responses to the same problem, another such mixed set. Like Samuel Beckett or Saul LeWitt, Eisenman pushes modern rationality to a postmodern point, the point at which its basic irrationality is exposed. Whereas Rossi seeks to redeem this rationality as he regrounds it in historical typological form. On the one hand, Eisenman stresses the postmodern subject, decentered to the point of schizophrenia, but represses its history. On the other, Rossi privileges this history but fails to acknowledge its postmodern subject or individual. In short, the two confront the postmodern condition in opposite ways that, though equally important, are equally inadequate. And in any case, neither practices a truly resistant architecture. For each, the, the primary referent of architecture is still the architect with a capital A. But then it may be that, that this whole idea of a, a critical architecture, or even a critical innovative architecture, can only be thought at this point, that it exists only in the realm of theory. And this, I, I hope, is not the case. But if there are certain models that propose this, or uh, at least are able to think, if not practice, a critical architecture as in the critical regionalism proposed by Kenneth Frampton, or the cognitive mapping advocated by Frederick Jameson. But there are problems with these models, too. Frampton begins with an opposition between universal civilization, call it you know, the civilization of American capitalism, versus regional culture. The first pledge to the expansion of things as the same, is to imagine a homogenous expansion. The second pledge to cultural difference, the preservation of, of old traditions. Now, rather than trust in the progressive aspects of this new capital, or in the traditional aspects of these old cultures, Frampton advocates a dialectical engagement of the one by the other, whereby each, in effect, critiques and corrects the other. It is an attractive idea, this idea that somehow you know, the new, new architectures, new technologies can be corrected by these marginal resistant cultures. But, I mean, it, it is an attractive idea, and, and in the, the work of the designers for whom, uh, you know, Frampton makes this case, people like Alvarado, or Jornitsen, or Mario Bota, it, it does lead to a provocative architecture. But um, unless one is a cultural Swiss, neither in the first world nor in the second, it may be impossible to, to act upon today. For the principle of a critical regionalism is tied up to an old system, an old problematic, developed as it is, as Frampton did develop it, from this old 36-year-old text uh, by the philosopher Paul Ricoeur called Universal Civilization and National Cultures. Now, in this text, Ricoeur could still look to the new post-colonial post configuration of the world with real optimism, given that he wrote in 1961, after the liberation wars of the 50s, wars like the Algerian War, but before the neo-colonial neo conquests of the 60s and 70s, like Vietnam. That is, before the neo-colonial repenetration of the third world by the first world as its labor fund and marketplace. In light of the last 36 years, such a sanguine worldview of a genuine dialogue between, say, our world and the third world, in which the, con the whole concept of a, of a critical regionalism is, is steeped, depends on this idea. To think that there could be such a dialogue now, I think, is romantic, to say the least. A similar romanticism undermines the Jameson model of a cognitive mapping. I'm sure you know that he, he draws this model from this, the, uh, the Kevin Lynch book, in which he says, well, uh, you know, why can't we 
construct an architecture or construct a city that can, can be understood perceptually and psychologically, can be grasped spatially. Now here too, there is a return to a distant moment in the first world. In this case, a moment before the full do dominance of the megapolis of the huge city. When, for example, people like Kevin Lynch could still chart their hometowns by references to old monuments. Jameson, of course, complicates the original Lynch model of cognitive mapping, as he must, given our, our present condition, our world in which our lives are as dispersed as our bank accounts and our spaces as complicated as a spin through a TV dial. Nevertheless, Jameson still hangs on to the basic principle that, that we should be able to map our city space. He, he hangs on to it despite the fact that this contradicts his, his very strong readings of the postmodern present, of whole schizo subjectivities and whole you know, deteriorized spaces of our present. And besides, it is strange for, for the most prominent you know, American Marxist critic to long for traditional monuments and psychological maps. But, you know, I've strayed from my original question. What architecture might be considered resistant or even pertinent to our techno-scientific moment? Certainly not an architecture of an information aesthetic, one that abets the ideology of the AT&T telecommunity. There are architectures, I'm sure you're familiar with them, that I think do at least address the immaterial, simulacral nature of our contemporary urban world. But do they do so with, with any criticality? Just as plug-in architecture of the 60s, mostly fed into the whole ideology of a consumer society, so too this, this techie cinematic architecture mostly feeds into the ideology of a purely post-industrial society, which is to say that it usually does not contest this, this ideology or expose its contradictions but rather presents the, the post-industrial future, say, as an accomplished fact. Movies like Blade Runner, at least, showed a collision of modes of production and modes of architecture. And in this collision, it pointed to lines of escape. I'm not sure that this architecture does. But if, if an information aesthetic is no grounds for an, a resistant architecture, one cannot, I think, merely resort to the old machine aesthetic either in its modern guise, in which the machine informed the architectural structure, or in its contemporary guise, in which the mechanical has become a sculptural motif or period de cal. It seems that like every museum or every other museum has a, a show based on this period. I mean, there's the, the Machine Age show at Lachlan right now. Now this suggests to me, not only that this, you know, this somehow is a closed period or a historical period. But also that the, it suggests to me that the machine is now treated almost as a romantic ruin. In fact, many young architects today seem to regard the machine in much the way that Piranesi regarded ancient architecture as an ensemble of ruins to be reclaimed as an architectural or historical allegory that is by degrees nostalgic, melancholic, oppressive, psychotic. You know, I wonder, just as an aside, if there are not other possible reclamations of the machine for architecture. You know, maybe surrealism uh, may give us a clue there. Here, though, I, I want to propose another approach, a neo-futurism. And this, I'm afraid, will, will again lead me, at least for a minute, away from architecture. Now, by neo-futurism, I do not mean a style or a school. I mean the term only to signal the need to respond to a new conjuncture of the technological, you know, such as electronic redefinitions of time and space, genetic transformations of life and death. Now the futurism in neo-futurism is to evoke the dangers of such a response. Misogyny, fascism, a wish come true in a war. Are these concomitants of any uh, futurist embrace of the technological. Now the neo in neo-futurism is to recall the, the history or the genealogy of contemporary futurism, 
to suggest that critics in the 80s, like Jean Baudrillard or Paul Virilio, derive from critics in the 60s, like Marshall McLuhan and Harold Innes. In short, the term neo-futurism, for me, signals a, a need to periodize the modern relationship or rapport with the technological. Now, one way to begin to do this is to adopt the long wave model of economic cycles, recently rewritten by the economist Ernst, Ernest Mandel. On this model, the capitalist West has passed through four 50-year periods, generally 25 years of expansion, followed by 25 years of stagnation since the late 18th century. First, the long wave of the Industrial Revolution until the crisis of 1848, marked by the spread of handcrafted steam engines. Then, the long wave of the first technological revolution until the 1890s, marked by the spread of machine-made steam engines. Next, the long wave of the second technological revolution until about World War II, and World War II, of course, is a great laboratory for technology, as all war is, marked by the spread of electric and combustion engines. And finally, the long wave of the, the third technological revolution, marked by machine production of electronic and nuclear systems. Now, history, of course, is hardly as neat as the scheme, yet it does suggest a way to periodize or to relate both economic stages market capitalism, monopoly capitalism, late capitalism, and cultural moments, modernism, high modernism, late or postmodernism. That's, that's far too simple. It also suggests a way to come to terms with the prehistory of our own technological present. For according to this model, the 1960s marked the midway point of the third technological wave, a moment when electronic and nuclear systems becomes structural to the mode of production. A moment when some critics, like McLuhan, are able to grasp the technological historically. The 1980s then, near the end of this long wave, are not so sanguine, not so optimistic. This is a time when electronic systems, no longer restricted to the means of production, enter the realm of consumer goods and everyday life. A time when some critics, like Baudrillard, see in the technological not a new history, but an end to history. I mean, there's, in this contemporary futurism, or as I see it, this contemporary futurism, there's an extraordinary apocalyptic impulse. I mean, it's, it's evident in art, in film, in, in fiction, I'm sure in architecture too. Now, I don't want to speculate on a new long wave, a fourth technological revolution, or a second electronic one, but God knows what biotechnology, the engineering of genes, of organisms, of entire ecosystems has in store for us. And I don't mean to see the technological as this, this property or this process that develops on its own, you know, independently, autonomously. In fact, it is only in our own time that, that the technological so dominates the social. That is, it is only in late capitalism, in the era of the state guarantee of corporate profits, that the vision of Marx of over a hundred years ago comes true. A vision of a society in which, quote, all the sciences have been pressed into the services of capital. And in which, quote, in invention becomes a branch of business and the application of science to direct production itself becomes a prospect which determines and solicits it. I mean, if you just think of the example of AIDS, AIDS research. I mean, corporations, industries are out there after a cure, not for any real humanitarian reason, but for the extraordinary profits that will accrue from, from a cure. Now, as suggested before, technology as practical application can no longer be defined in distinction to science as theoretical knowledge. There is instead technoscience, as Leotard calls it. The instrumental integration of research and development, knowledge and power. Now this system erodes definitions on all sides. The difference between body and not body, with organ prosthetics, genetic coding, wet circuits. The difference between life and death, 
with all the attendant bioethical questions that face us today. The difference between nature and not nature. With nature no longer able to contain or recoup techno events like Chernobyl. This is real deconstruction. Practice not on literary texts or works of art or buildings, but on our very bodies and on our very environments. In such deconstruction, disciplines like architecture are eroded as its objects, body and space, are transformed by new machines and new speeds. Given this practical deconstruction of architecture by rampant techno-scientific scientific developments, do we really need the theoretical deconstructions that Eisenman and others propose? Now, one effect of our techno-scientific condition is a techno-schizophrenia, a belief endemic at least to my generation that technology will save us from death and that it has foreclosed the possibility of a natural life. We are all technocrats and Luddites, machine wreckers at the same time. And after Bhopal and Chernobyl, the Challenger and Star Wars, this has not really changed. Technoscience, it is true, is no longer legitimated in terms of capitalist progress or socialist liberation. It is pledged purely and only to profit and power. So if it abets an ideology at all, it is the ideology of the non-development of society, of deterrence in all respects. Things will just stay as they are. By the way, it is no wonder, I think, that this technological deterrence, the fact that you know, we, we spend you know, such an extraordinary amount of our public monies into, into pure war, war that is not fought ever. It's no wonder that this, this system provokes as its corollary, or as its opposite, terrorism. This is not to say that the dialectic of technoscience is somehow finished. This dialectic remains, and it is that of the good old enlightenment, and the, the whole project of modernity, the need to get out of superstition into the modern scientific war. And this logic, I think, is this. As the objective world is rationalized, the subjective world is irrationalized. I mean, just think about MTV. I mean, the, the editing is extremely technical, extremely rationalized, but its effects, its subject effects, are extreme, extremely irrational. Here a line from the great writer J.G. Ballard may help make this clear. In a recent story, he proposes an updating of the signs of the zodiac. He writes, the houses of our psychological sky are no longer tenanted, no longer housed by rams, goats, and crabs, but by helicopters, cruise missiles, and interuterine coils, although those are somewhat passe now, and for good reason, and by all the specters of the psychiatric ward. In other words, I think what he means here is not only is nature now penetrated by technoscience, but it, you know, there's no nature that seems not somehow affected by these developments, but so too is our unconscious. And far from an end to reaction and superstition, cruise missiles and the like have made reaction and superstition proliferate like mad. Now, now given these conditions, what would constitute a politics of the technological today. To Ernest Mandel, belief in the omnipotence of technology is the specific form of bourgeois ideology and late capitalism. Belief in the omnipotence of technology. This means, I think, either total faith or total fatalism. I think most of us may have the latter. Either a commitment to or a resignation to its totalitarian logic. Now, both these positions must be rejected. But in favor of what? What is a valid techno-politics for first world people like most of us are? The productivist position, the position that says, well, you know, you as artists, you as writers, you as architects, you must enter into the, the mode of production as it is today and transform your art, transform your writing, transform your technology, your architecture in keeping 
with these developments. Fifty years ago, Walter Benjamin, you know, presented this productivist position. He called artists, architects, writers to an active transformation of the technological apparatus. But then that call was made in the context of socialist revolution, and the technological apparatus in question was far, far simpler than our own. If transformation seems utopian today, what about resistance? Well, I mean, resistance seems romantic too. Immediately, a question arises. Resistance from what point? Is there, in the first world, an outside to the technological? If one decides that there is not, one might take up a futurist line to accelerate rather than break technological speed. Yet as the fate of futurism shows, it is not possible to out-capital capital for long, to out-media the media. One simply advances it and then dies in flames. Another option historically is the situationist one, an intervention of noise or of silence in the general noise of the media. Now, the situationists were uh, a mostly French group in the 50s and 60s who came up with the whole concept of our society of consumer culture. I mean, they, they felt that our society really ran by the transformation of all experiences into images, into spectacles. And they thought that in such a system, there was really no way to make any political change that could not be recoded by the system of spectacle. So they said, well, wait, why don't we just intervene in these spectacles? whether it be like a, you know, a presidential campaign or a Super Bowl. Uh, if, do you remember Captain Midnight on HBO? That, that, that is a good example of, of a situationist act. It's the guy who, who somehow was able to, to overcode the transmission of HBO from the satellite and put on his own message for a few minutes. But what is exactly the site of such an intervention, a situationist intervention? In other words, is there a technological scene that can be so taken over, that can be symbolically seized? We must get inside pure war, says Virilio. We can't represent contemporary technologies, says Jameson. How do we get beyond this metaphysics of representation, which technology, after all, has eroded? How else can we conceive the problem? To me, the first step in a politics of technoscience is to think our way out of any historical determinism or imaginary necessity rega regarding the technological. There is no neat line of modes of production. There is only a conflictual development of technologies. And the exposure of this history, of its conflicts and contradictions, opens up possibilities, opens up a way, on the one hand, to resist the dominant technologic of the first world, and, on the other hand, to avoid the romanticism of the non or less technological in other worlds. On a practical level, artists, writers, architects might articulate the conflicts or contradictions between our given techno-social paradigms or models, between, say, the spectacular world of the car and TV and the informational network of the computer. Now, it seems to me that, that we live in a moment when the whole society, the spectacle that was really propped up by this relationship of car, TV, and commodity, the whole you know, urban space that it allowed has begun to change somewhat. I mean, new, new commodities have become structural to the economy. In, the, in a way, the computer has, has uh, you know, more and more replaced the car as the core commodity. And with, you know, with this change will be whole changes in our perception of society. And rather than simply you know, go with one or the other, it seems to me that, that one thing to do in a provocative, critical way would be to get at the conflicts between these two models, these two moments. Now once exposed, these conflicts, these contradictions, renew a whole range of positions, each for a specific context, for a specific moment. The productivist position, the resistant one, the futurist one, the situationist position, all these may have a particular use at a particular place at a particular time. Such a revision may even allow for convivial uses of the technological 
and who knows, maybe even utopian ones again. And yet, I mean, to end here, I think, is, is foolish. For it's, this is simply too positive. Uh, maybe, it, it, uh, maybe it just shows what a product of my culture I am, that my, my examples are, are from Hollywood. But I, I think to the, uh, back to the beginning of the movie, The Terminator, of a world, if you remember, made up of machines that produce machines to destroy machines. It's a perfect circle of production and consumption with people, with the, with the social, completely marginal, completely useless. This is no simple fantasy. For we are today in a permanent war economy in which so-called defense is structural not only to our world position, but to our everyday lives I and mean, to, our, to our economy as we live it. Thus, you know, Star Wars, I mean, the reason why it was, I think, so important to the Reagan administration is that it was, it was one answer, perhaps, to the question, how to resolve the, the contradiction between industrial and post-industrial modes of production? How else but by a huge public and private project that combines heavy industry and high tech? This is pure war. This is pure deterrence. Or no, no actual war, at least on our front, is fought at all. But nonetheless, it is a war in which technologic, technology, you know, totally dominates the social. Okay, that's, that's the negative ending, and that's my real ending. But I, I want to, to suggest to you that, that these problems have to be seen dialectically, which is not to say, in terms of Marxism, is to say that they have to be seen for the, the good and the bad that is in them. Uh, it does seem, for example, that, that technology seems to be produced for its, for its own consumption, for its own sake. On the other hand, it, it does still liberate us. And it, it does still provide new experiences, new thrills that shouldn't be you know, merely trashed. But that's that. And I, <laughs> if you, um, there is a way to, pl to apply this to architectural questions, I would love to hear them because I, I can't quite figure it out. So if you have any <laughs> questions or comments, now's your chance. I know it's about 100 degrees here. <coughs> Go ahead. Well, you know, I'm, I really am not an architectural critic. I'm not very informed. Um, but, I mean, just in general, for me, it seems to me that we really have to re rehabilitate the idea of utopia. Because, I mean, it was so trashed by its, its use by the moderns. And, you know, we, in many ways, lived the dystopia that was the utopias of the moderns. I mean, that's, that's very unfair to them. But it's, I mean, the most extraordinary thing I think about contemporary American culture is its apocalypticism, is its uh, belief that you know, personal life will end in cancer or AIDS and public life will, will end in a holocaust. And, you know, I, I see it within the art world especially. Um, 
It's just it's just rife, and it it suggests to me that there's a uh, there's almost an inability to to think progressively about the future, and I don't think it's a simply a a limit, you know, that is the fault of any individual. I think, uh, for example, this technologic that is so part of our our society and economy play right to it, structure it, in fact. Um, so when I, when I think of utopian practices in architecture, I don't think of the modernist ones. I'm not sure I think of the ec ecological ones. I, right now, am very interested in, in another idea of utopia, which is really an idea that was developed in the 20s and 30s, just at the moment, really, of modernism, or one modernism, uh, in France and in Germany by by people like, well, in France, the Surrealists, in Germany, people like Walter Benjamin and Ernst Bloch. And for them, uh, the utopian was, a, was a, a principle to recover from the past and to inject it into the present. The reason why the Surrealists were important to a critic like Benjamin was that they somehow were able to, to, to pick up on the wish symbols of the 19th century, on, on products, objects, images, spaces that somehow were expressions of the, of the longings of the, the 19th century bourgeoisie. They were able to pick up on them and, and put them into the present in such a way that uh, the, that, that 20th century present would be opened up a bit. So any, you know, any real utopian impulse, at least for me, has to also recover lost or repressed aspects of the past. And when it does that, I and mean, that's when things open up. When, when this idea that, that you, you look for the conflict or the collisions between different economies in the present. I mean, that's what that's all about. Rather than to see it simply as this, this total world in which you know, I as an individual am, am impotent before. You know, to, to look at its cracks and to see what you know, lines of, of the future are opened up, at, you know, in these cracks. That's that's at least the theoretical possibility that interests me. But I don't think it's simply a matter of theory. It's, it's, it can be part of a of an actual practice, as it was for the surrealists. It can be, I think, part of an actual architectural practice. So maybe you see like MTV as a model of No, but if you, I think if you collided, say, MTV with or the old economy of the, of the car, then you might begin to get at, you know, different perceptual models, different social models that really are in conflict today. I mean, people who talk about the post-industrial, the post-modern, make it sound as if it's a, it's a whole total system that is in place. My point is that it's never totally in place. And there are always ruptures, always weaknesses, and those are the ones that can be developed, and those are the places that can be developed. I, mean, for, I think there's, a, there's a, the possibility of the use of, of the machine aesthetic that would be related to this idea, that wouldn't simply be about kind of a romantic uh, nostalgia for the machine as like a cute little object man. Well, now I've really begun to blabber. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Oh, sure. Yeah, but I mean, I agree with you that this, you know, our present is really continuous for the last 50 years with these other changes, but I think you can, and in fact, you must periodize this, this whole post war development because I mean, it's, it's no coincidence that, that there was futurist thought in the 60s and there now is again futurist thought in the 80s. And there's, there are things that, that prompt this, and you know, these, these conditions do change. And I'm, I'm sure it can be that these problems can be thought from another position, but and and I, I do in my own work. But when I was struck by your your phrase, labor unions, minorities, and so on, I think there's a real tendency on the left. And I, I really don't mean this, but, but you do this. I think you know I have done it. I think many people do. It, there's a there's a, a tendency to to refer to difference, to different social groups, as the hope of the future, in a way that that fetishizes them. And when I say fetishizes them, what I, what I mean is that, they, that it's like a, a reflex to say in left criticism, well, women, gays, and blacks. It's usually in that order. And that what that does, I think, is it sounds progressive, but what I think it really does is that it takes these groups and takes out all the differences that are in the groups and turns them into like stereotypes for you know, the, the wishes of the white, the, the guilty white. I mean, that's what, that I, what I do constantly. It's the thing that I have only come to see in my own work. I think it's a, a real common tendency. And that's why I wanted to, to think about these problems, you know, and not simply look to, for the utopian in these other groups. No, th I know that's not your point. I just, that was one thing that I wanted to make. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't, but I don't mean to. I mean, I, I hope you don't see them as somehow divorced. How would you connect that? Well, that's that's where the work has to be done. Because I mean, right now this is obviously at a very superstructural level. I mean, I want to deal with the, the uh, you know, what it is like to be a body in the present, a male body in the present, for example. You know, what are the what are the new spatialities, the new subjectivities? That we that we live, and that's that's the, the level that I think one has to begin with, and then one has to, to work back to what you know provokes or produces these spatialities and subjectivities, and whether that is done with this model or that model, I mean that that's another question, I and mean, that has to be argued. I'm not, I'm not that that's perhaps what you know where I why I stop because I'm not perhaps I am not able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I certainly hope so. Although, it, um, there, I mean, there is this feeling, at least in the art world right now, which which I know, I'm, I'm much more familiar with it, that there is no criticality in criticism, and that that this occurred basically when the theory was picked up by artists. So, uh, you know. That's that's somewhat of a problematic point for me right now. Uh, well, I think there there is there is an argument that that there there is no criticality left in high art criticism, high culture criticism. That it, it's migrated to mass cultural studies or other forms of you know, critical practice. You know. Perhaps into into political economy, social theory, 
And at least in the art world, this happened at the moment when theory became used as, as a press release for artists. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's our condition right now in the, in the, at least in the New York art world. It's you know, fairly, fairly grim. Go ahead. Well, I'm not totally convinced that I cannot. I just did not do it here. Uh, but I, I am very touchy about our history because I do feel that I'm, I'm not an issue. And it's the place, it's one of the places, but the primary place where I feel uh, most divided by you know, the division of languages in society, and the division of labor. Uh, it is somewhat opaque to me. And I think it is in part because architects, like artists, like critics, they, you know, they have a special language. And I mean, it's, but it, it's, it's, I'm very sensitive about this because I, I'm sure you architects here are too. I mean, uh, so often I am confronted with the question, well, you know, what is it that you really do? What does this really mean? as if criticism or art or architecture should be somehow transparent in a way that, that tax law or advanced medicine you know, is assumed not to be. That's what disturbs me. When you say that it's a, it is public, and I don't really know how it is public. It, it may exist in public space, but then how do you really define this public space? I mean, how, how is it public? And, and uh, how to, you know, how many levels of, of reading are there in architecture? I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's what I find, or did find, so diabolical about postmodern architecture is that it seemed to be coded in terms of public readings that were really in terms of class or, cla or terms of initiation. And, uh, you know, I'd rather have illegibility than, than exclusive readability, I guess. But, you know, that wasn't really an answer, I'm sorry. Go ahead.
Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's why I have, you know, negative and a positive ending. Uh, I mean, when you first gave us this image of, of kids before TV sets or before computers, and I thought, uh-oh, you know, here's, here's the grim view of the future, where everything is done to us. You know, but the very ab ability that it is, you know, that things might be done to us technologically through this kind of telecommunity, even though it's a vision, uh, suggests that we might be able to, to do it for ourselves. I and mean, there, there are uses, there are uses of new technology that are not only manipulative, but only repressive. And there, there are thrills to them. I mean, there, there are whole new registers of feeling that cannot be dismissed as simply a trashy or evil. Well, I, I think uh, it's it may be represented in part by people at the school. Um, yeah, I think they're. I mean, I, I'm sure that that's not the program as they see it, but uh, I mean, that's that could be one reading. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't see this as a theoretical possibility. I'm I'm here just as a you know an interpreter like you. I, mean, I think there are these practices out there, um, but I, you know, I, I push this line because I really do see this this uh, this desperation that there you know there are no objects ca that can be made, no buildings that can be built, or this extraordinary apocalypticism, and that that to me is that end game is the uh, is the enemy, and so this I mean this for me is one one way to think about practices that get out of such a double bond. But I don't really want to name names. <laughs> I don't think I could. Is everybody about to melt down? So <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks for coming.